analytical transformation optics. I probably shouldn't even call this video analytical transformation optics because this is just transformation optics. But it turns out probably the most traditional way to apply this is using analytical equations. And it's also to make it different later on what I'm calling numerical transformation optics where it's completely numerical. And the benefit of that is the shape of the cloak and the shape of the object that we are cloaking can be anything. When we're applying analytical transformation optics, we're restricted to what we can describe with analytical equations. Anyway, here's the basic concept of transformation optics. We start off with our standard coordinate system and we define a line or a bunch of different lines that basically show the direction of a wave. The next thing we'll do is come up with a coordinate transform such that if we plotted the same path in this transform coordinate system, the path would bend the way that we wanted it to. When we apply transformation optics, we end up back in the original coordinate system, but our material properties changed. And our material properties changed in a way that this, the wave would bend in the way that we prescribed by our coordinate transform, but we do not have a coordinate transform. We have modified materials. And as we know, what transformation optics does is move the math from the coordinate transform into the material. So this sequence of pictures makes sense from that perspective. Step one in this, pro in this process is to pick a coordinate system. And we pick the coordinate system that is most convenient. And typically this will be the shape of the object that we're cloaking. If we're producing a cylindrical shaped cloak and cloaking a cylindrical shaped object, well, the cylindrical coordinate system would likely be most convenient. If it's rectangular as short of things, well, then the Cartesian coordinates would be most convenient. When we begin to do this numerically, we'll do exclusively Cartesian, even if our cloak has cylindrical or spherical symmetry, we can still do that on a Cartesian grid. And since the computer's doing all the work for us, uh, that, that doesn't matter to us anyway. So step two, we have our coordinate system and we draw our straight rays in this untransformed coordinate system. And most of the time people pick vacuum for the background material. So we'll set our mu and epsilon to all ones. So that's vacuum or air. And this is usually the most difficult part. We come up with a set of equations that define our coordinate transform. And here, what we're trying to do is squeeze the rays through a little pinhole. So maybe the wave squeezed down, goes through a pinhole and comes back out. Uh, but we're just doing this for demonstration purposes. So we've defined our coordinate transform such that these red lines, the path of the wave, would now follow the path that we want. Given that we have our coordinate transformation, we calculate our Jacobian. So starting with the equations of our coordinate transform, we know how our Jacobian is defined and we're in Cartesian coordinates here. So we go one tensor element at a time. And we're starting with these equations. We're taking all of the partial derivatives that we need to populate this tensor. And what we really see, there's only two difficult ones that we had to calculate. When we populate our Jacobian, we end up here. So that is the Jacobian for this sort of pinching transformation optics example. Now that we have the Jacobian, we can transform our material properties. And we started off with vacuum in the back. So this really is just the identity matrix here and here. We use our Jacobian and calculate the permeability and permittivity tensors in our transform coordinate system. When we work through the math, we end up here. Now the math can be difficult, but in principle, it's simple. We're just doing a bunch of matrix multiplications. And here's our final tensor. Now I'll present to you some MATLAB code. This is using the symbolic toolbox, but we can use this to generate those equations. And it's actually quite simple. We can make MATLAB do all the work for us. 
So we start off defining our symbolic variable. So it'll be X, Y, Z, and there's no sigma X and sigma Y that's describing the, uh, the extent of our pinching or the size of our pinching. So I'll use S, X, and S, Y, so S in place of sigma. So we're declaring our symbolic variables. We'll initialize our materials to free space. And so I is the identity matrix, so it's a three by three matrix for both mu and epsilon. Now we define our coordinate transform. So X, Y, Z is the original coordinate system and X, P, Y, P, and Z, P is our transform coordinate system, the P for prime, since MATLAB doesn't give us a prime symbol for variables, I'm just using P. And I've literally just typed in the definition of our coordinate transform, and that ends up here. These are symbolic variables, remember, Y, X, S, X, S, Y, Z, these are all symbolic variables. And so now X, P, Y, P, and Z, P are now symbolic variables. Now we build the elements of the Jacobian matrix, and we're using the power of the symbolic toolbox, which can take these derivatives for us. So we are differentiating XP with respect to X, right? That's this first tensor element. Second tensor element, we're differentiating XP with respect to Y. The third one, we're differentiating XP with respect to Z. And then in the next row, we're differentiating YP with respect to XYZ. And then the last row, we're differentiating ZP with respect to X, Y, and Z. So MATLAB's doing a lot of work for us symbolically. And we end up with our Jacobian matrix. After this, we transform our materials. And we're simply just typing in these equations for the transform. Remember, we had the identity matrix at first. Um, so really, we don't need those here. However, if we wanted to go play with this and try something else, well, then we, you know, we have to leave them here. So now we have mu and epsilon uh, that where we move the math from the coordinate transform into mu and epsilon. Then the last thing I like to do is use the function pretty, which shows this tensor and its elements with it still displays to the command window. So it's still text but it kind of uses ASCII art to display the equations. And so it does look rather, or at least nicer than just as it would do otherwise. And when these equations get big and ugly, this is probably not such a good thing to do. We might want to do pretty ER and then a parentheses one comma one to look at that first tensor element and look at the tensor elements individually. Now, because we've set mu and r equal to each other, we really didn't even have to repeat that, but I like to set up my code so that if I did something miss, messy up here and I change my er with respect to ur or whatever, then everything would still work. So I am being redundant here, and it's pretty fast. I don't have to worry too much about that. So at this point, our transform is done. What if we want to build this device onto a grid so that we could think about simulating it? Well, that's what this step does. And so the very first step here, we're taking our symbolic ER and everywhere there's a sigma X, we're putting 0.25 in there. So that's the value we're using for sigma X. Everywhere there's a sigma Y, we're also putting in a value of 0.25. So we're just replacing these symbolic variables now with 0.25. So the only symbolic variables left are X, Y, and Z. Now we go into this loop, we, we set up an array over X and Y, and we set up a double loop to loop over X and Y. And what I don't wanna do now is overwrite my big ER anymore. So what I'll do is I'll take the big ER, replace X with whatever the value of X is at wherever we are in this double loop. So at this point, little ER is big ER, but no longer X being a symbolic variable, it's replaced it with a numerical value of wherever the position is we're talking about. Then I go back to ER again, I replace Y with whatever our numerical value of Y is. And so ER is now a completely numerical equation. It's a three by three tensor now with all numbers. So we can go into our grid and we're retaining the full anisotropic tensor here and we just extract the nine elements of little er and populate these points on our grids. And so when we go through both X and Y, we end up populating 
all nine of these 2D grids. And when we do that for this problem, well, so that's very slow, <laughs> I forgot to mention that. Here's where we end up when we do that. And so if we would incorporate these materials into a grid and simulate it, we should see those fields pinch. Now there's some practical aspects to this. We've pinched our fields down to this infinitely small point. So in a practical sense, this wouldn't work. I don't think we'd ever wanna pinch down to an infinitely small point. I think we'd wanna pinch down to a larger point uh, to make this work a bit better. But in principle, this is where transformation optic ends. And from here, we'd wanna pick up and figure out how to realize the metamaterials and other things. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.